So let's speak a little bit about the future. You changed from your job, from the Guardian, the famous Guardian, we all know, to, let's say, a small and a new and for now right unknown company or new online portal. Why did you do it? Well, it's it's small for now, but it uh, it won't be small for very long. And and to me, the exciting opportunity was the ability to be able to build a new media organization from start um, and to try different things. I've written a lot about what I think are flaws in the American media, and so this is an opportunity instead of just writing about other people's deficiencies to try and do the kind of journalism. Um, and to build the kind of news organization that I think has been lacking. So it's it's a really great opportunity, and there's a lot of funding behind it, um, and that makes a lot of difference. How did it happen when you first met uh, Pierre Omidyat? Did he come to you like, just saying, hell, I have a lot of money, I just would like to invest in you, or how can I imagine it? Um, it was a little bit like that, but, but basically, um, the three of us, Laura Poitras, who is in Berlin and with whom I've worked so much on the NSA stories and Jeremy Scahill and myself were actually, before we even talked to beer already talking about how to build a new media organization. We've been, we were a little bit frustrated about our ability to do reporting on the NSA documents and other stories, the way that we felt like we needed to and wanted to. And we felt like we had the platform at that point to be able to get the resources together to create a new media organization. And just as we were getting started planning, Pierre actually did call. He reached out to me to say that he was building his own new media organization um, and wanted to know whether or not I would be interested in doing some work with it. And the vision that he had, which was, I want to use the resources that I have to support independent journalists and to enable independent journalists to do hard-hitting adversarial journalism against the most powerful factions without any fear of resources or other things, really was very consistent with the vision that Jeremy Laura and I had created. And so it made sense at that point to join forces and to create what we were already creating in conjunction with what he was doing. Mm, great. What kind? What do you think? What kind of motivation does he have? Just to the motivation of Pierre Amidia? Did he speak about it? He did. I mean, obviously, somebody who has as much money as he has, um, which is so much money that it's actually difficult for him to give it away as fast as he's trying to do so, isn't motivated at least primarily by making money, which is a really positive thing because you can build a new media organization without having this immediate pressure to generate profit. And what he did say was that he has had various stages in his life. He was first a technologist when he created eBay. Over the last 10 to 15 years, he's been a philanthropist, basically investing his money, giving it away to various causes. And he now wants the next stage of his life to be as a journalist. And he talked about wanting to do something new and different in journalism if he only wanted to replicate what the New York Times or the Washington Post were already doing. He could have just gone in and bought either of those papers. But he wants to create something very new, fundamentally different, um, something that really is geared toward um, supporting independent journalists, truly independent adversarial journalists. And, and that, I think, is what is motivating him most. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I just would like, you already spoke about it, how is it to work like for, it's like a different step just to, you don't work for a big company like The Guardian anymore, but you're working for, let's say, a billionaire, he's your chief right now, what is the difference, you, do you think that you can really work independent? I think the, we can work much more independently, I mean, I don't think he has had a single conversation with anybody about any of our journalism, and I'd be surprised if he ever does. Um, the idea from the very beginning is that we're not there to be interfered with in terms of what it is that we want to write or how we want to write it or what it is that we want to say. And, you know, the every a lot of people like to say that, oh, I'm committed to independent journalism, and then when you actually get into it, it becomes much different. But the thing that convinced me of the sincerity of his desire is the fact that he went out and hired exactly those journalists who are most renowned for being, if you want, difficult or independent, people who 
everybody knows would never, ever tolerate anybody interfering with what it is that we're writing. We would just simply quit the minute that anyone tried to do that, whether it be myself or Jeremy or Laura or Matt Taibbi or lots of other journalists whom we already hired. And so, you know, had he gone out and hired a bunch of journalists who have been working in large media organizations for a long time and are accustomed to being very compliant, you might say, well, it doesn't seem very likely that he's going to really give independent journalists their independence, but the fact that he went out and hired exactly those people who he knows in advance would be very boisterous um, if he tried in any way to tell any of us what we can and can't write, even indirectly, um, I think underscores the fact that he is serious. And, and what we've been doing is building this media organization on our own with no involvement from him when it comes to the journalism. He is involved in the structure in terms of how it's going to be funded and organized and set up. But in terms of the journalism, um, he's played no role at all in that, and that's how it's going to continue. Do you think you can do even a critical article about eBay? Sure, I can write a critical article about anything I want. Um, and, you know, as I said, um, I would, you know, when I was at The Guardian, I remember when I first went to The Guardian, a lot of my readers said well, you've always written these very aggressive media criticisms and that's been really important. And now that you're at The Guardian, which is a really important newspaper, you're not going to be able to write those criticisms anymore because you can't go to The Guardian, work at The Guardian, and then criticize The Guardian. And what I said at the time was, no, that's absolutely false. I intend fully to criticize The Guardian when I think it's warranted. And I did. And I intend to do exactly the same thing here. I'm not going to go out of my way to write about eBay I don't think I've ever written one word about eBay in the eight years that I've been writing about politics long before I ever talked to Pierre. So I'm not going to go out of my way to do it just to prove that I will. Um, but at the same time, whatever stories that I feel like writing about or opinions that I feel like expressing, um, I'm going to express them freely um, without the slightest regard for what Pierre might think about them or how it might affect his other interests. You know, we like German journalists, you know, the Germans, we are always skeptical about everything, yeah? And uh, we are always right. on the point like, we, yeah, <laughs> like we ca cannot imagine that a guy is just doing, or a billionaire doing everything just for sponsorship. Is this a different mentality too between, let's say, the Germans or the European uh, Europeans and the American way of investing? You know, I think it's more just about individuals and, and what their life experiences are and where they end up in their lives. I mean, you know, look, we're skeptical, too. Skeptical in the sense that we by no means think it's 100% definite that the promises that have been made to us are the ones that are actually going to be fulfilled. So we definitely are on guard. Um, I was on guard when I went to the Guardians to make sure that they were going to really honor their promises about my editorial freedom. Same with every place that I've ever written. But we became convinced that he is serious about that. Um, there's lots of evidence that we've seen that he is. Um, and like I said, we don't really feel like we have anything to lose. I mean, if, if it turns out that we're wrong, we're just going to quit and we're going to go do something else. And none of us is worried about that. Um, but, you know, I think that people who make um, more money than they can possibly spend in their lives, um, some of them just want to keep making more. Um, others of them start looking for other ways to make their lives meaningful and to make a mark on the world or to do something good. Um, and so, yeah, of course, I mean, I think skepticism is warranted um, until you see the actual evidence. Um, but, you know, I think that it would be shocking to me um, if not only did he try to interfere in our journalism, but the, the journalists that we've hired um, and who are writing there uh, would ever allow that to happen. And I guess only time will tell. Yeah, we, you already spoke about it. Do you think it's really because there's a lot of things going on? We have like Pierre Amidia, we also have like Jeff Bezos who invested in the Washington Post, there are a lot of other big players. Do you think this, how do you judge this new kind of, let's say it in a positive way, uh, sponsorship in philanthropy? Is it a good way for the journalists? Is it important for the journalism to have this kind of people? It's one way. I mean, you know, the thing that has surprised me about the debate that has arisen over Pierre's investment in, in, in First Look, Jeff Bezos's purchase of the Washington Post, is it seems to be based on this premise that there's something new or different about the fact that large media outlets are owned, funded, and controlled by a small number of very rich people. 
that's been going on for decades in the United States, if not longer. I mean, the largest corporations have controlled the most important media outlets. Extremely rich people and rich families have, through generations, owned the most influential newspapers. You know, it's just the nature of how media outlets are owned in the United States, for better or for worse, um, that extremely rich people fund and control them. Um, and this is no different. So the question then becomes, if you're a journalist, um, what kinds of terms for your own writing are you able to negotiate, um, and what kinds of freedoms are you going to demand for yourself, given that if you want to work for a large media organization, one that has a lot of power and influence and can get big journalistic projects done, you're necessarily going to be relying on the funding of a handful of very rich people, whether it's Pierre Amidia or Jeff Bezos or the Graham family, or the Solberger family that owns the, the New York Times, or Comcast that owns NBC and NBC, or Disney that owns ABC. Um, that's always the challenge. And I think it all depends on the individual journalists and how much leverage they have and how much commitment they make to being free as journalists, um, and also the individual funders and, and what their willingness is to fund media organizations while ceding control over their content. But do you think that this is a good point, actually, that we are now right restart to invest in investigation story or give more money for investigation stories? Is this is there a change? I think it's a very big problem that large media outlets have struggled financially in the age of the internet, and the reason I think that is because it affects the journalism in very negative ways. So, for one thing, media outlets are dramatically reducing the people that they hire, the number of people they hire. So they no longer have correspondence to cover wars. So government officials are much more able to lie about war because you don't have a lot of reporters there to see the truth. Um, you have a climate of fear in newsrooms because when media organizations are very financially um, precarious, when they're suffering economically, they're petrified of ending up in long procedures with the government or lawsuits with large corporations. So their lawyers are there to basically err on the side of caution and not publish anything that might end up dragging them into lawsuits with very big corporate or governmental entities. So you get this climate of fear, you get much worse reporting, far fewer resources, and so these really big institutions with unlimited resources like big corporations and banks and government agencies end up not being scrutinized or checked nearly as much as they ought to be. And so if you have a model where a billionaire or somebody very rich says, I'm going to put a huge amount of money into a media organization so that you no longer have to worry about these financial constraints, that you can actually do hard-hitting um, journalism, have lots of resources in it so that you can stand up to these large, media large governmental and, and corporate entities, um, I do think that's a good thing. There are obviously downsides to you don't want to rely exclusively on billionaires. There are billionaires who will interfere with the journalism, and that's not a good thing. Um, I don't think it's the only model to save journalism, but I think it's one model if you find the right funder who's truly committed to this template of, of truly independent journalism. Okay, great. So last question. Um, can you tell us about something more? Uh, give us a sneak peek what you are creating with First Look Media. What's your vision? Well, in the short term, we basically started earlier than we probably otherwise would have because we needed a place where we could aggressively report the remaining NSA stories, of which there are a lot. And so for the first three to four months, that will probably, or not probably, definitely, that will definitely be our overwhelming focus. But as our journalism and our focus grows, we want to bring on a really diverse uh, group of, of journalists, diverse in every way, um, in terms of their demographic attributes, but also their perspectives and their voices and their ways of doing journalism. And we want to create a newsroom where journalists pursue their own passion, where they're not told by editors, go cover this, and go write about this, and go do this, and churn out eight different posts a, a day. Um, we want to have journalists who tap into the sentiments that cause them to go into journalism in the first place and to investigate people who wield power, economic and political power, um, and to do so without fear and to do so by finding their own unique voice and not being homogenized um, and doing it the way that they feel most vibrant and honest doing it. And as long as everybody has this baseline 
of rigorous factual accuracy and checks to make sure that everything is factually accurate, we want to vest the autonomy and the authority in the journalists themselves to figure out how best to do journalism, how best to engage readers, how to fulfill the goals that they were thinking about when they entered this profession. And, and we just want to give that climate, that environment to people as much as we can. Mm -hmm.